There's this thing that's now kind of uh, going wild on the internet. I've never tried it, but it's called Turkisterone. Turkisterone. Yeah, they call it Turk. This plant compound is equ equivalent to DECA? Essentially. Wow. Yeah. Where do you get this stuff? Uh, people buy it on the internet. How do you spell it? So I don't think a day has gone by over the last few months as someone hasn't asked me about my opinion on Turkestrone. Now, if you haven't heard of it yet, it's the spicy new supplement on the block, and there are a lot of people on the internet who are very excited about its potential as a muscle builder. So in this video, I want to have a look at what the science actually has to say. Well, before we can understand what Turkestrone does or doesn't do, I think it's important that we first understand what it actually is. So Turkestrone is one of many types of ectosteroids, which are basically the plant and insect equivalent of hormones like testosterone. So humans produce testosterone, plants and insects produce turkesterone and other ectosteroids. And since turkesterone and testosterone are actually fairly similar in terms of chemical structure, perhaps since human testosterone is anabolic, maybe the plant and insect version is as well. Well, this idea first caught the attention of researchers way back in the 1970s, when a team of scientists from Russia took some mice liver, administered turkesterone, and according to this abstract on this non-secure Russian database, it was a effective at stimulating liver protein synthesis, which I just quickly note, isn't the same thing as muscle protein synthesis. Now I tracked down the full text for this paper and it turns out it's 145 pages of broken Russian text about rodent liver metabolism. So there isn't much else that I can say about this one. Through the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, a few other papers looked at protein synthesis in different animals and insects, but once again, these studies were all published in obscure journals with substandard acute study designs and whatever they found, it couldn't have been that exciting because no one bothered to pursue any actual human research on it. That was up until 2006, when a group of researchers, including my friend, Dr. Bill Campbell at the University of Florida, got a spark of curiosity after noticing a suspiciously well-muscled insect crawling across one of their old muscle physiology textbooks. So they took 45 weight-trained men and put them into one of four groups. Three groups took different types of potentially anabolic supplements, including an ectosteroid group. Now it wasn't turkesterone exactly, but it was structurally similar, and it belonged to the same class of compounds. One of the groups just took a placebo, meaning they also took a pill, but there was no active supplement in it. And this is really important because it means that the groups didn't know if they were taking ectosteroids or just a blank placebo pill. It's possible that if they knew that they were taking ectosteroids, that knowledge alone might have gotten them better gains simply because they were expecting it to work. So none of the subjects knew what they were taking. The researchers put them on a four day per week upper lower split and after eight weeks of supplementation found no difference in fat free mass or one rep max strength for any of the groups. There were also no differences in free testosterone, total testosterone, or testosterone to cortisol ratio. The ectosteroids didn't work any better than an empty sugar pill. So understandably, not much happened or was heard about turkesterone after this until just a few years ago, when in 2018, the International Society of Sports Nutrition published a joint review of supplement recommendations and made the firm conclusion that ectosterones, including turkesterone, are not recommended to increase training adaptations or performance. But that isn't quite the end of it, because the very next year, in 2019, the latest study that I'm aware of came out, and this is the one that everyone is talking about, because unlike the others, this one actually did find an effect, and it was in humans. So let's have a look. They put 46 men with one year of training experience on a 10 week training program and gave them either a placebo pill or a peak ectisone supplement. And this is the actual supplement that they gave the subjects, which the author state was quote, labeled to contain 100 milligrams of ectisterone. And I think that's an interesting phrasing that we'll come back to here in a minute. First, as you can see from the graph here, this time the ectisterone groups did experience significantly better muscle gains than the placebo group. For the record, the EC1 group took two peak ectisone pills per day and the EC2 group took eight peak ectosome pills per day. One other thing to notice here is that the placebo group actually lost muscle mass on average, which can happen, but is pretty odd to see for beginner lifters following a 10 week structured training program. Now, a possible explanation for this is that the study used single frequency bioelectrical impedance to measure body composition, which is notoriously unreliable for getting accurate measurements, especially in comparison to the DEXA machine that was used in that 2006 study. But there's another stronger reason that I do think this study is bunk. That peak ectosone supplement that was labeled to contain 100 milligrams of ectosterone was run through a lab analysis, which found that it only contained six milligrams of ectosterone, not 100 milligrams. Just 6% of what was advertised on the label was actually in the bottle, 
Now, when I found this out, I tried to think of what could have possibly happened here. How did the peak ectosome groups get better gains if there was only a dusting of active ingredient in the pills to begin with? Well, the first thing I thought of was maybe there was something smuggled into those peak ectosome pills that was stronger than ectosteroids. We know that it's common for supplement companies to lace their products with banned anabolic substances to boost their products' effectiveness. And this seems like a valid assumption here on the surface. However, if you dig into the study's supplemental materials, you'll see that they did in fact collect blood and urine samples from their subjects to test for co-administration of prohibited substances and nothing showed up. So as I see it, there are two most likely explanations for why this study found an effect. Either there was in fact something in those pills that simply wasn't tested for, or the results were a false positive. I actually wasn't sure how credible a false positive or type one error would be here. So I called up my friend and supplement expert, Dr. Eric Trexler, and he reminded me that false positives are not as weird as you might think. It's not that rare to get a false positive, right? So like, let's say the P value is like, you know, 0.049, right? A 5% chance or a 4.5% chance of something happening is not rare. Then you consider small sample sizes and the fact that there is sampling error. You get groups of, you know, 12, 15, 20 people. They don't always have the same characteristics, even though you would hope that they would with random assignment to groups. What if there's four people with just insane genetics in, in one of those groups. That, that's why we like to see so many studies and so many replications from so many independent groups is only when you have all that data can you sort through it and, and figure out which findings were atypical and which findings were more typical. Now, neither of us are saying that the results of this study were a false positive. There's no way of knowing that, but rather just pointing out that their findings simply don't add up. You then stack that with the fact that they use bioelectrical impedance and don't forget, ectosterone isn't even the same thing as terchesterone. So if I was trying to sell terchesterone, I personally wouldn't use this study to do it. So as of now, I think it's safe to say that this supplement is not science-based. There's just no science to lean on. And instead it's relying on anecdotes and marketing hype to stay relevant. And while there's nothing necessarily wrong with considering anecdotes, they simply aren't controlled like scientific studies. And this can be a problem, especially when it comes to supplements. And that's because anytime anyone starts taking a new supplement like terchesterone, it's nearly impossible to control for all the other variables in their regimen. Many times at the same time someone starts taking a new supplement, they also crank up other aspects of their diet and training. So unlike scientific trials that use multiple subjects and control for confounding variables as much as possible with single anecdotes, how are we supposed to know if that person got the results from the supplement itself or from the fact that they're a newbie lifter who would have gotten gains anyway. Or maybe they just started training harder because they felt more motivated by the new stack. Or maybe they just placeboed themselves into getting gains because they bought into the hype. Now, of course, it's still possible that new research will come out showing that trichesterone works. And if that new evidence outweighs the current evidence, then I'll change my mind. And assuming there's no side effects, I'll start taking it. But until then, I won't be opening up my wallet because I just haven't seen any convincing evidence at all. And this seems to be the consensus amongst well-qualified experts as well. Now, if you're interested, I spoke with Dr. Eric Trexler about trichesterone on my podcast. We discussed some issues with people wanting to get ahead of the science and some of the other specifics that I couldn't get into in this video. So I'll go ahead and link that full interview down below if you're interested. And before we go, I do wanna thank Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Skillshare is a huge online community that has thousands of classes for creative people looking to learn new skills like video production, photography, productivity, marketing, business, and more. Over the years, I've used Skillshare to help me with my own online career, whether that comes to taking a course on photography or email marketing or graphic design. I think mastering these skills is essential to running a successful online business or brand. And even though you can outsource some of this stuff, I really think that it is important to have a basic understanding of these concepts for yourself so that you ultimately have the power and control to create what it is you want. One of the best things about Skillshare is that the classes are taught by people who also do creative work themselves. So the content is always highly relatable and relevant. It also gives you access to a huge knowledgeable community of people who are also eager to learn. I personally just finished up this course on productivity for creatives from Thomas Frank, and I found it really helpful as someone who does sometimes struggle to balance creativity with productivity. With Skillshare, there are thousands of courses for every skill level from beginner to advanced, where you can learn the basics and specifics about pretty much any skill that you're looking to master. So the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the first link in the description box down below will get a free one month trial of Skillshare so you can start exploring your creativity today. Skillshare's classes combine video lessons, class projects, and hands-on feedback with short lessons that are easy to fit into a busy schedule. So make sure you're one of the first 1,000 people and get a head start on that skill that you're looking to master. Thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring the video. I really do appreciate it. And thank you guys so much for watching. Don't forget to leave me a thumbs up if you enjoyed the video, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you guys all here in the next one.